offering you a real choice in television viewing. This is WMVS Milwaukee. This program is made possible by a grant from the Walter Schrader Foundation, Incorporated. You know, uh, did, uh, did I ever say to you that I think one of the secrets of our being happy right along while we were married was because we would go down to the theater and act two other lovers every night? That's interesting. Why? Well, we became two other people that night, you see. So we had a little variety. <laughs> I'm George Schaefer. I'm a director. I've directed some 250 various plays, television shows, and films, and been privileged to work with most of the great actors and actresses of our time. And it's been a great time for acting. And yet when I'm asked which of the many experiences stands out as being the most exciting and the most rewarding, I don't hesitate. It was the opportunity I had to direct, work with, and get to know Alfred Lunt and Lynn Fontaine. Husband and wife, they were the modern theater's greatest acting team. Unless you think I'm prejudiced because I know them, when I say that, I must tell you that years before I had any hope of ever meeting them, I saw a performance that they gave in the New York Theater that was still the finest single evening of theater I've ever seen. And I'm a great theater goer, two or three plays a week all my life. And yet the greatest of them all was the Lunts in Robert Sherwood's There Shall Be No Night. It was a powerful and moving wartime drama. I remember seeing it in the early 40s at the Alden Theater in New York shortly before I went into the Army. One of those perfect blends of the temper of the times with a great play performed brilliantly. Extraordinary evening, one I will carry with me all my life. The Lunts gave performances together like that for almost half a century. They appeared night after night in cities and towns all across the United States and England. To the public, they were symbols of elegance and wit and glamour style, sophistication. And yet when a play's run was over or a tour complete, it was here, to this quiet retreat in rural Wisconsin at Genesee Depot, where they came to unwind. It's like an ivory palace. Each room has its individual burning fireplace. And if you go outside and look around the roofs and count, you'll know why they named it Ten Chimneys. First, you find a private, unmarked entrance. And you go in and up a road, around a bend, and suddenly you're in another world entirely. Every corner of it filled with fascination for me. In fact, anyone who stayed struck could stay on here forever. Alfred took great pride in the estate and loved showing guests around. To me, Alfred Lunt was simply the greatest man I've ever known. Brilliant, warm, kind, witty. He was an absolute giant. When he died in August of 1977 at the age of 84, Broadway's marquees were dimmed for a minute in tribute. And for those who knew and loved him, those lights will never be as bright again. The Lunts were married for 55 years and were an inseparable acting team for most of them. They were equally talented and both perfectionists, but the combination of the two was greater than either of them individually. They, they sparked each other. Lynn invited me to Ten Chimneys a few months after Alfred's death, and I persuaded her to chat with me the way we'd done so often in the past, but this time in front of television cameras. We discussed their remarkable career, and she told me how they first met. She'd gone to a theater in, in New York for an audition for, for a new play and was waiting backstage for her entrance. I could hear a new voice it was a scene on the stage, and I could hear a new voice uh, uh, before I went on. And um, presently, he came off and went up some stairs, and then he looked back and saw me, 
He came down the stairs and fell, fell down the stairs. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> now, there is an entrance. Yes. One of the great historic moments in the history yes, of the uh, American was, English Theatre, right be. there. Oh, that's, <laughs> I didn't know that. That's wonderful. And then you actually did appear together in, 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 in that play. Yes, in that, that first, play, yes. First, Young uh, Man's Fancy, it was called. was called, ah. Well, now, once you had played together, did you have any inkling then that you would like to continue acting as a team, or was it were just oh, two yes, members of the oh, company? Oh, yes, we made plans. Right, right, oh, in that very right, first... Uh, right away, yes, we were going to act together. We fell in love right away. Well, that mm -hmm. always prejudices one a little bit. How long was it from that first performance that you, you, you played together until you were married? Was it three years. Three years after that. Mm -hmm. And you had been, been acting together. Mm -hmm. One thing I, w I wanted to ask you about, very personal, but uh, be kind of fun. I noticed in, in going through one of the books that there was about a six-month period between the time you and Alfred announced your engagement publicly and the time you got married. Mm -hmm. I wondered whether that was planned or whether there were postponements or whether you ever thought about changing your mind or anything else about that that you might remember. That no, I think he went on tour. I think that he went on tour, so we made it, <coughs> we made it that we would be married after the tour. Did you have a formal kind of a wedding? No, we both married at the City Hall. That sounds an interesting story in itself. Did you plan it that way or was it... <laughs> Uh, yes, we planned it that way. I mean, we, as a matter of fact, Alfred said, let's, let's get married now. Let's go be married now at City Hall. I said, all right. And we did. We took a taxi down there and got married. The date was May 26, 1922. After the ceremony, Alfred wired his mother in Genesee Depot, have made an honest woman of Lynn. And then he took his bride to Coney Island where they sat for their wedding portrait. I think have been more uh, articles written and speculations in the New York Times and the theater magazines as to Miss Fontaine's age. And, yeah. and uh, <laughs> one who's who will give one date and another who's who will give another. And a great deal of energy has been wasted. And I must say, I don't think I'd have been undiplomatic enough to bring up the question. <laughs> but since you brought it up, and it was so, I'd love you to tell me again how that whole age mix-up came about. Oh, well, uh, when Alfred and I first met, he asked me how old I was. And I lied about five years. <laughs> He died one year when I asked him how old he was. And when we got to Genesee, somebody gave him away, you see. So I knew he wasn't that year younger. And, um, but he didn't ask me if I'd lied, you see. He never asked never me, asked. so I never said anything. <laughs> so all our married life, he's been thinking that I'm five years younger than I am. And you know, I had to lie all over the place. It was terribly difficult <laughs> keeping up that lie. And I, I was so relieved. The only thing about his death was, was the relief of saying, now I can say I'm nearly 90 years old. Not a, <laughs> <laughs> when they were married in 1922, the Lunts were both rising young stars who had already made names for themselves individually. Lynn's career had actually begun when she was in her teens and had appeared in a Christmas pantomime in her native England. She'd been recommended by the legendary British actress, Ellen Terry. A friend of mine gave me a letter of introduction to Ellen Terry. And of course, Ellen Terry was like uh, Dusa, Bernhardt, and we had our Ellen Terry. You know. yeah. And um, so I walked down the King's Road Chelsea, 3.15, and I stopped there, rang the bell, and the famous maid opened the door. Well, she, then she said, oh, go upstairs and um, knock at the first door on the left. So, I did. A husky voice uh, said, come in. I went in, and Miss Terry was sitting up in bed having her breakfast. And she says, looked at me, and she said, come here. And I went there, and uh, she, her bed was very low, so I knelt down. Yeah. 
And she put her hands on my shoulders and kissed me. The first time that you'd ever seen her? Yes, she kissed me. Then you were in the pantomime at, at Drury Lane. Yes. And how did you get from being a young lady in a pantomime into, into uh, you know, speaking parts, as we say today? Well, I understudied. I understudied the fairy queen. And um, she didn't play one night. Well, and I went on. That's the standard. Yes. Yeah success story right out of the yes. movies. But did someone see you when you played the part as the understudy and uh, give you other jobs from there? Or no, no, I, no I had to work very hard to get a job. And I met Lorette Taylor. The great Lorette Taylor was one of America's leading actresses whose glorious career started with ingenues and ended creating the role of Amanda in The Glass Menagerie and Mrs. Midget in the revival of, of Outward Bound. She often appeared in plays that were written by her husband, Hartley Manners. And Miss Taylor saw Lynn in Milestones. I was introduced to her at a party, and she thought that I was a society girl. And um, so she didn't talk to me at all. She wasn't interested. And then I said something, and she says, your face is familiar. And I said, yes, I'm in Milestones. And she said, are you, are you that old lady, that, that middle-aged lady, that young girl in, uh, in Milestones? I said, yes. And she said, well, I would like you to come to America with me. So right Just away. Just like that. Now, Milestones was interesting because you, you did play three, three completely different ages, all in the same year. Yes. In the same same evening. Yes. And you were probably too young for the youngest one at that time. You were still very young. Yes, at that, yes. That time. Yeah, I'm better as a middle-aged one because they said that was the hardest. The, the first super part I think of you, and correct me if I'm wrong, was 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 Dulcie in in, in the they played Dulcie. Now did that come because of the Lorette Taylor connections, or was that something completely different? No, it was um, written that way. And um, uh, George Kaufman wrote it, and Mark Connolly, mm -hmm. and um, they thought I could play it. Lynn was a tremendous hit in Dulcie, which opened in 1921. Critic Alexander Wolke termed her performance at the vague, babbling Dulcinea brilliant. And at the same time, Alfred was devastating audiences in a comedy that had been written especially for him by Booth Tarkington. Clarence. You see, like Lynn, Alfred had yearned to be on the stage since childhood. He was born in Milwaukee in 1892 and received his early schooling there. Later, he attended nearby Carroll College, and in his third year, Alfred transferred to a college of oratory in Boston, but after two days, took a job instead with the Castle Square Theater. He played in stock companies and toured in vaudeville with Laura Hope Cruz and Lily Lankry. His career was launched. Then the movies beckoned, too and he appeared in three silent films in 1923 and 24. Second Youth in 1924 also featured Lynn Fontaine by then his wife. In 1925, Alfred appeared in D.W. Griffith's film, Sally of the Sawdust, but his role was somewhat overshadowed by that of an up-and-coming comedian named W.C. Fields. By the time the movies began to talk, the Lunts had established themselves as major Broadway stars with the Theater Guild, and Hollywood invited them to put their highly successful show, The Guardsman, on celluloid in 1931. The experience was not an entirely happy one. It was a very happy experience as far as the director was concerned. I mean, he was wonderful, and uh, we were helped tremendously by him. Well, why, why were you so put off making movies after that, that the, I'm, well, sure, I'm sure people we were after you well, all the we time. Did, we didn't think it was as interesting as the stage. Just in what you did, you mean, in the, in the yes, work? I mean, we had plays offered us on the stage, and we'd rather act on the stage than do movies. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> Indeed, when Carl Lemley, the head of Universal Studios, later offered them a quarter of a million dollars to make another film, Lynn is said to have remarked, Mr. Lemley, we can be bought, but we can't be bored. The Guardsman, thus, is the only film of the young Lunts in starring roles. In it, they play an actor and actress married to one another. He suspects her of indiscretions, and to test her fidelity, disguises himself as an amorous guardsman. There is a story from the guardsman. I wonder if I could persuade you to try to tell it. It concerns your going to see some of the film, some of the daily, the rushes of the early film, which Alfred oh. would not see. Do you remember that and story? And Bannon and uh, on the way back to me, that, uh, that one. Uh, well, he wouldn't see it, and I went in, and um, I came out. I said, it is, you're marvelous, Alfred. You're absolutely marvelous. You photograph beautifully. Oh, by the way, you don't put enough rouge on your lips um, or something, because you look as if you haven't any lips, no lips at all. But otherwise, it's, it's just makeup, that's all. Nothing matter with you otherwise. And you're very good in your part. It comes over beautifully. And uh, uh, I, I can't tell you anything else. And he listened to all this, and he, and he paused a long time. And he said, no lips. <laughs> and I knew that that was going to keep him awake all keep night. Keep him awake all <laughs> night long. <laughs> the lip story illustrates their legendary quest for perfection. No detail was too small to analyze, argue over, and put in its proper place. Once, after a play had run for two years, Alfred demanded a rehearsal on the day of the final performance. When a script called for him to play a musical instrument, he insisted on doing it for clarence, saxophone lessons, for subsequent roles, he learned the accordion, piano, even tap dancing. Devoted to their craft and highly disciplined, they demanded the best of themselves and of those in their company. Alfred often said that a tour with the Lunts was like being interned in a concentration camp. But it was the same idealism and love for the theater as art that led them to sign with the fledgling theater guild in 1924, where they joined a group of people dedicated to presenting drama of the highest order. The guild showcased worthwhile new plays and playwrights. All the uh, managers in uh, New York made an offer to put us under contract. And um, the theater guild made, made us an offer. And we saw Terry Helburn, and she said, you get um, 300, we've been getting $600 a week. And she said, you'll get $300 a week. Combined was this, or separately? No, no. Each. 300 each. Oh, I should hope so. Well, that, uh, Even that that's half ridiculous. of what we've been getting and half of what we could get. And so uh, they, they let us read the guardsman. And we said we'd take it. Well, did they go out hunting for, for, for uh, vehicles they, then? Yes, but they, they did um, separate us. They put him in one and play him, me in another theatre. Oh, I didn't realize yeah. that. After you'd started acting together. Yes. That was a very uh, nice of them. Uh, strange interlude, you know. Of course, you you created uh, uh, Nina, isn't yes. it, in, in, in that? Yes, and uh, he, he was at one theater and I was at another. Well, that must have been very difficult. Actually, there's probably nothing in Strange Interlude that Alfred would have wanted to, to play, although I think he could have probably played. Oh, the, they wanted uh, him in something else. He yeah. had. He had another play, I think, another O'Neill play, I think. Oh, really, at the, at the time? Do you feel that O'Neill uh, was America's great, greatest playwright, Lynn, have you ever thought about? Well, I wasn't as great an admirer. I was an admirer of his, but not as great as uh, they made him out to be, I didn't think mm -hmm. I, but I, I, I could be, I was wrong, of course. There was an awful lot in strange interviews. It was extraneous and just taking up time and uh, repetitious also. And I went to him and said, could I, cut this line, that line, and that line. Would it break your heart if I cut them? Because they're repetitious. And, uh, 
And um, he said, no, you mustn't cut anything. So then I cut an awful lot without his knowing it. <laughs> <laughs> How many of your plays did Alfred direct, actually, as a director? I know, I know he directed a lot of other plays for other people, but... Uh, uh, you know, I forget. He directed... Um, I can't remember the name of the play, but I remember it irritated me very much. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering, I thought I was going to ask you, but it yes. was difficult oh, to have to work with him difficult. as a director as, as well as a, yes. an actor, because... Uh, yes, he was rather showing off a bit, too, you know. Uh, I could have leapt over the orchestra and hit him. <laughs> <laughs> their plays were staged by some of the theater's best directors, including their dear friend, Noel Coward. He and the Lunts were often thought of as a threesome. And actually, Lynn and Noel grew up together in London. They were friends since they were both youngsters. Noel Coward was 17. He went to a dance hall, and after the theater dance hall in London, there were lots of them. And I was there, and he says he met me then, but I have no recollection <laughs> of him. <laughs> I don't think he'd approve of that at all. I think he'd like... Oh, he knows. I didn't, <laughs> didn't remember. And uh, then he came to New York, and uh, he had enough money to get to New York and a little money, and he used to come to dinner with me every night so he didn't have to pay for dinner in restaurants. Mm -hmm. And um, This then, was before you were married to Alfred? Mm-hmm. And then I knew Frank Crowning Shield, who uh, 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 was head of a magazine, and uh, Condé Nast, who was the head of Vogue. And um, so I introduced him to Frank Crowninshield uh, and told Frank, Frank Crowninshield to ask him for a piece and read it because he wrote, he was writing extremely well. And Frank did and gave him four hundred dollars for it. That was four hundred dollars, you know. Now this was before any, any really. of the plays had been successful, wasn't it? He was still just a uh, beginning oh, playwright. Yeah. He had. No, he hadn't. Um, no, he hadn't done anything. He hadn't really done anything no. in, in acting with and, and working with uh, with with No Coward. That the, the his way of acting and his his style of things was special, was different than than than. Yes, it was. It was because it, it, you it know was. I I only was lucky enough to see him in two, you know two or three performances and, and know him just slightly, but it seemed to me that he brought a a whole different kind of a rhythm to 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 mm -hmm. his. Uh, his acting. It was a crisper, yes. a little more artificial, and yet very genuine. It never mm -hmm. seemed uh, false. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know what you mean. Yes. But again, I, did, was that something he worked at, or was that something that just was... was oh, I don't he, know. I really don't know, because he began very early, you know. He, he was a boy actor. True. He was with uh, Charles Hawtrey. He began very early. Yeah. He was a lovely companion. To me, Noel Coward was the essence of the best of English theater. Another of their closest friends was the model for the man who came to dinner, Alexander Wolcott. He was a man of petty tyrannies and a gigantic ego. And although some people obviously didn't like him, the Lunts cherished his friendship. And of course, everyone knows that he was witty. And I can't remember one witty thing he said, <laughs> not at the moment, anyway. And, um, uh, he, of course, he was life and soul of every party. Did you find New York First Night audiences in general off-putting? Well, the Guild First Night Guild audiences, was obviously yes, terrible. They're, they're all I found almost all, I just dreaded New mm. York First Nights. Uh, mm. uh, completely abnormal Yes, I used to reaction. be very nervous. I wasn't nervous on the opening night of the visit in New York, because I played it in Ireland, I played it in England for a run and um, played it on the road a little bit. And I wasn't nervous at all. Well, that was a, a, a gale a night. I must say, Millie and I were among the lucky ones to get in that night, and we were there, and it was the opening of the theater named after you. And mm. I remember it was champagne flowing in every bar, and then that yeah. fancy carpet across 44th Street, wasn't it? 40, yeah. yeah, 44th Street, and then we all went over to the ballroom. Yeah. And you came in, you danced, and you shook hands with everybody there, and it was a fantastic evening. We shook yeah. hands that night. You don't remember it, but we did. It was we before shook we hands, met. Did we? Oh, yes, we joined the line with everybody else. Really? And, uh, yeah. uh, it was a 
What an exciting performance, my goodness gracious. And a very difficult play to do, because that's a big theater, you know. The Lundfontein really Ooh. is not intended for the spoken <laughs> yeah. word. It's much better for musicals. Much, which, much better. Uh, much better. I was surprised that it was a success, but it was. Although Durin Matt's The Visit was a very grim play, it was turned into an exhilarating theatrical evening by that master stager, Peter Brook. Well, he, he was a wonderful director. Uh, we, we had one scene together, Alfred and I, and we rehearsed it. We put in things and everything. You know, uh, well, Peter would um, criticize whether we were loud enough or, or too loud or, or anything like that. He's never criticized us. We did that whole scene. We had one where he said, uh, look, there's a deer. Look. That's when he jumped, you see. And we both pointed like that. Together. And we both jumped together. The Visit was the last play the Lunts would perform on Broadway. Later they toured with it, playing towns and cities all over the United States, as they always did with their plays. And finally they took it back to London, where they closed in 1961. The young Alfred Lunt and Lynn Fontaine first acted together in 1920. They were featured in some of the Theatre Guild's greatest hits, among them The Guardsman, S.N. Behrman's The Second Man, The Enigmatic Goat Song, and three plays by Shaw, The Doctor's Dilemma, Arms and the Man, and of course Pygmalion. It was 24 years after that, in a radio broadcast, that Lynn recreated her fascinating portrait of the captivating Cockney Eliza Doolittle. The Guild thought it made good box office sense to put them in separate productions, but after 1928, they flatly refused and never again were to act apart from one another on stage. That year, they played Caprice, an elegant drawing room comedy, and later they took it to England, where Alfred made his British debut. That was the beginning of a long love affair between the Lunts and London. It was back to New York in 1929, where they played Meteor, written for them by S.N. Behrman. He was one of many playwrights, who wrote scripts in the hopes that the Lunts would perform them. The stock market had crashed that October, but audiences came to see Alfred and Lynn nonetheless. They kept coming all through the Depression years. In 1930, they won raves with Maxwell Anderson's Elizabeth the Queen, a study of the turbulent, ill-fated love affair between Elizabeth and the Earl of Essex. The usually reserved opening night audience in New York brought them back for 17 curtain calls. Then in 1931, they performed Reunion in Vienna with Alfred as an Austrian Archduke and Lynn as his ex-mistress. In this Robert Sherwood comedy, they played the scorching, intimate love scenes with which they became identified, and which were somehow considered proper since they were actually married in real life. In 1933, their Theatre Guild contract was up, and they were free to appear with Noel Coward in Design for Living. Coward had written this provocative romp for the three of them, and it sparkled with the witty repartee for which they all were celebrating. Once, uh, he, they had a scene, very funny, very witty, and um, one night one of them said the other's line, so the other one said his line, and they continued saying each other's and li <laughs> line, uh, and thought it was very funny indeed, you know. I happened to be standing in the wings, and so when they came off, I said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself, really, this is disgraceful. <laughs> And, um, Took your discipline to keep them alive. <laughs> yes. And uh, they went off to a movie. They were afraid, afraid to go home. <laughs> uh, in 1934, they again performed in a coward play, Point Belaine, but it closed after only 55 performances and was probably the least successful of their many vehicles. In 1935, the Theatre Guild wooed them back with a promise to do Shakespeare. They chose The Taming of the Shrew, and helped stage a joyous, imaginative production with dwarfs, acrobats, tumblers, and their good friend, Sidney Greenstreet. Then next, Robert Sherwood dedicated his idiot's delight to them, and for it, Alfred became a song and dance man. The anti-war play was the Pulitzer Prize winner of 1936, and oddly enough, it was in this play that the Lunts faced censorship problems. And you were going to play in Omaha. Yes. And, and, and they, they wouldn't wanted, let you they play wanted to, They wanted to delete certain words in the play, probably damn or something like uh. that, you know? 
Uh, and um, uh, we said, no, we, we don't change our script for anybody. We, we won't, won't do it. We, then you cannot play. Very well, sir. So we didn't play. Well, the whole country waited for this, this verdict about going on that, that night. And um, he was rather a stupid man. It was, it, was it a board or a mayor? or who, A mayor. Who, the mayor of yes. Omaha. Uh, he was a stupid man. And the people didn't care for him very much. How he got elected, I don't know, but he did. And um, everybody was calling us up and advising us from different parts of the country what to do, you know. I, I forget what it was that finally made the mayor say, well, yes, we can play. So um, we played. And the audience, they knew every line that the mayor objected to. You see, and every time it came to that line, they just stood up and roared. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was a most strange performance because we were beyond ourselves. You see, the audience was so strange and wonderful. We, we you know, you have to rise with them, and uh, we did. In 1937, they first performed Amphitryon 38. S. N. Behrman had adopted Giridou's version of how the Greek god Jupiter assumes human shape to seduce Amphitryon's wife Alcmena. Alfred joked that Jupiter's wig made him look as if he'd swallowed Shirley Temple. And then in 1938, they played a Chekhov masterpiece, The Seagull, with Lynn playing the vain, self-centered actress and Alfred in the role of her lover, Trigorin. In those years, they were seldom idle, rehearsing, playing, touring, and then traveling to England to do it all over again. They played in every kind of theater on every kind of stage, from huge auditoriums to tiny churches to tobacco barns. And by 1940, they were exhausted and hoped to return to Genesee Depot to relax at their beautiful home. Their plans to rest were forgotten when they read a new play called There Shall Be No Night. The play dealt with the Russian invasion of Finland, and Alfred played a Nobel Prize winning Finnish scientist determined to stay in his country and resist imperialism. Lynn was his American wife, and their son was played by an intense, young, unknown Montgomery Clift. They opened in 1940 to critical acclaim. England was already at war, and Lynn's thoughts were often with her country. In 1940, she broadcast a moving poem, The White Cliffs of Dover. Later, she recorded it and donated her proceeds to British war relief. In 1941, they took There Shall Be No Night on the road, but the tour was cut short by the bombing at Pearl Harbor. And with other entertainers, they began to work regularly at the stage door canteen. Alfred, typically modest, was usually on the garbage detail. The somber mood of those years was lightened by their performance in 1942 of S.N. Behrman's The Pirate, it was a spirited, romantic satire with music, dancing, colorful costumes, and Alfred is a strolling player who performed feats of magic. But the war continued, and Lynn felt she must go to England. Alfred agreed, and they opened in London in 1943 with a revised version of There Shall Be No Night, this time depicting the German invasion of Greece. During its run, the Lunts played through air raids with buzz bombs crashing around the theater. Servicemen and women were often in the audiences, including a favorite, General George Patton. He came backstage, and um, then, after a lovely visit with me and with Alfred, uh, he um, left us, went down to the stage door, and came out, and the light from the stage door was, oh, it was like a searchlight you know, because of the, the blackout was still on. Mm -hmm. And um, this, um, he came and stood in this searchlight, this light. And he stood there. The roar that went up from the people. He stood there. You know, he was uh, six foot tall. Mm -hmm. And he stood there. And he 
took that seed, but it's, oh, you never knew anything like it. It was so beautiful. And then he held it for the exact right amount of time, and then it got quickly into the ca a car and drove away. The Lunts stayed on in England and began rehearsals for a new play by Terence Rattigan called Love in Idleness. It opened in 1944 in London's Lyric Theatre, and despite bomber raids and rationing and cold theatres, they never missed a performance. After the joy of VE Day, the Lunts donned uniforms and took their play on tour for the troops in France and Germany. Then it was back home to America, and when they arrived, the newspapers ran a handsome photo. In January 1946, they brought Love in Idleness, now called Oh Mistress Mine, to New York, and it was Broadway's first gala opening after the war. In fact, Oh Mistress Mine was their biggest hit. Altogether, it ran a total of four years in England, then on Broadway, and finally on the road. Alfred played a wartime cabinet minister, and Lynn took the part of his mistress. It's the only play that I ever saw two nights running just to watch the two of them work. In the United States Company, her prudish son was played by a young man who years later would star in television's Eight is Enough, Dick Van Patten. In 1949, Life magazine ran a cover story on them as they opened a new comedy drama, I Know My Love. It was about a couple in several different stages of a long marriage, from youth through old age. They themselves had by now been married for 27 years, but Lynn, in her 60s, seemed every bit the elegant young wife, and Alfred made a dashing roué. They played from 1949 to 1951, despite Lynn's broken arm in Maine and a blizzard in Pittsburgh. Because of the storm, the scenery hadn't arrived when they reached Detroit. None of our uh, costumes arrived either. And um, uh, we, we uh, had to go on in our street clothes and, um, and a ladder for the stairs. No, no scenery was there, either. No scenery, nothing. Uh, I know I said one thing during the performance. I said, uh, 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 this lovely room, this beautiful staircase, something like that, you see. Yes. <laughs> and the audience just rocked. They played in another Noel Coward work from 1952 through 1955. It was the romantic comedy Quadrille, which their fans loved, even though critics praised the players more than the play. One mentioned that the Lunts would be a delight to watch, even if they were reading the telephone directory. In November of 1955, they opened in Lindsay Krause's The Great Sebastians, a frothy melodramatic comedy, with Alfred and Lynn cast as a vaudeville mind-reading act, and toured that show in 1956 and 1957. And finally, The Visit by Friedrich Dürrenmatt opened the newly named Lunt Fontan Theater on May 5, 1958. The Lunts loved the challenge. They craved variety in their work. They were occasionally accused of not choosing plays of more substance and of playing it safe. But taken as a whole, their work refutes that charge. They had infinite range and infinite variety. I was privileged to direct them in a Hallmark Hall of Fame production of Emmett Lavery's The Magnificent Yankee about Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes and his wife Fanny, for which they both won Emmy Awards. It was the last performance they gave together, and it's the only record in color and on good tape of the two of them in fine fettle and in major roles. It really happened, the thing we dreamed of so often, you in Washington. But no chance of our having arrived too late, is there? You know there isn't. Oh, a man can fool himself, 61, not know yeah, it. but not you. Now, what shall we say to Mr. Dixon? He's in the kitchen waiting for your verdict. Yeah, my yes. verdict? Who found this house, anyway? Who told the postman we were going to take it? Do you happen, by any chance, to know what this piece of furniture is. Wendell, I do declare that's my rock. Fine state of affairs, I must say. Not only take a house without consulting me, even move in the furniture. Oh, that was you gone. conspire with this Mr. Dixie. Da darling. You connive. Dixon. 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 You connive with yes. Mr. Dixon. Darling. You what? Wendell. What? Don't you like the house? Like it? Why, my dear, I'm enchanted with well, it. Well, then. Only. Only what? Oh, I wish you let me have the fun of thinking that I was commanding officer around here just once. Oh, no. <laughs> George Schaefer. And the, uh, and the, uh, the British director. Well, well, we had good times. I must say, I look back on the, uh, 
the Magnificent Yankee is uh, truly one of the most enjoyable rehearsal periods that, uh, yeah. that we ever had. We were down in uh, yeah. the awful uh, yeah. Central Plaza building down there on 2nd yeah. Avenue in New York, and uh, we'd all struggle down to the Ratner's delicatessen to be insulted by the waiters, and you and Alfred would come in with your little case and open it up and have these rare and delicate lunches up above. We were all very jealous. <laughs> Yeah. But it was, it was fun. Did you find acting for television different? Did it, did it bother you in any way? Uh, no. It was rather like a rehearsal. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, there was no audience feel about it that you had in the theater. Did you miss that? Yes. <laughs> I can believe it. I would think it's very hard to... to uh, uh, yes. But it was interesting. It was very interesting. And yes. I loved seeing it when it was done. Did you, did you find that you and Alfred, uh, how shall I say, bounced back and forth, that the interplay between you was as, as, as much same. as in the... It was the same. Just the same, yes. Because I must say, the one scene, that I, I loved it all. It's my happiest memory, I think, in television. But the scene, when you were getting well along in years, in front of the fireplace, you were doing some knitting or something, and he was trying to make up a speech to give it Harvard. Do you remember mm -hmm. that scene? And went around and it had always had been wonderful in rehearsals, and I always liked it. And suddenly when we were taping that particular scene, something happened to the two of you that no one could describe, but it, it just, thank goodness, there it is on the tape. Mm -hmm. But absolute magic between the two of you. It was as though you'd never rehearsed, that you'd never seen it before. Suddenly it just yeah. got a dimension. I'm unaware of that. Oh, Fanny. What am I going to say to my old classmates? What I... No, no, no. Sit down. Sit down. Wait. Listen to me Why I gather a little wool, will you? All right, but we mustn't forget Mr. Adams is waiting downstairs. Adams. Adams. You know, Fanny, the trouble with me was that I was adding up the years the way Adams would add them up. Well, life is not doing a sum. It's painting a picture. And sometimes... We have to have a little faith that the canvas will fill out as we go along. <laughs> Fanny, I am a believer in spite of everything. I believe in my country. I believe in its people. I even believe in myself and the universe of which I am a part. Of course, I haven't enough evidence to prove all this. But then life isn't a matter of evidence because you never can have enough. It's a matter of faith in a universe not measured by fear. That's the trick, Fanny. That's the trick. Not to measure things by our fears, but by our faith. Now you're beginning to come out from behind those beautiful white whiskers. Yeah, feel naked somehow. Naked but warm. You know, Fanny, the trouble with men like Adams is they have no fire in their bellies. And where there's no fire, there's no hope. Now, belly is not a nice word. Oh, I give up, woman. Here, I've been pouring out my soul to you, and all you say is that belly is not a nice yes, word. To some people... Well, all right, just... all right. If you think it will offend the delicate sensibilities of those old Harvard boys, we won't say it. But belly is what I said and what I mean. This is the chest. <laughs> this is the stomach. This is the belly. The place where a soldier's faith is born. I don't recall that ever happening on any of the other hundreds of television shows I've directed. But when we finished that day, the entire crew, the whole studio, everybody broke into applause and cheers when we finished taping that show. Do you remember that? No. Yeah, you, you see, you forget all the nice things, and you shouldn't, because it... Well, uh, I forget they everything. Were, they were really... <laughs> they also appeared together in three other television productions. A special taped in Greece, entitled Athens, where the theater began. The Great Sebastians, directed by Franklin Schaffner, and The Old Lady Shows Her Medals, written by Sir James M. Barry and directed by Tom Donovan. In that play, Alfred appeared only briefly as the narrator. I like that. I love that old lady. Oh, it's a wonderful play. And it, uh... I loved doing it because I'd seen it played, and it's, it's over-sentimental, you know, this old lady. It's nauseating, really, quite bad. And I didn't like it when I saw it from the front because of that. So that when, when I played, I took all the sentiment out of it. 
because mm. those girls are not sentimental, they're too hard up against it, you know. she is over my shoulder near the parcel post window the heroine of my story for some time now i've been wondering how to introduce her to you shall i first tell you all the nice things about her how she is one of the kindest char women in all london and how every morning armed with her mop and pail she starts out on her daily rounds or Shall I come right out with it and tell you that she is a criminal? Oh, dear, I can't remember the name of the director. Such a nice man. For television, was this? Yes. Tom Donovan. Tom Donovan, yes. yes. Dear friend of mine, wonderful, oh, wonderful is director. He? Wonderful oh, man. he's a darling. He's so good to me. And um, it, I surprised him. I, I, I turned and opened a drawer and got something out. And I was going to a party that night, you see, and um, got something out. Said, I'll be all sm I mean, I've got to get up some breath. I'll be all smiles tonight, love. I'll be all smiles tonight. Though my heart will break tomorrow, love. I'll be all smiles tonight when the suitors gather round me. I'll hail them with delight. Da 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 da. I'll be all smiles tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Did you make that up, or was that an old song? No, no, no. It was an old song. Oh, well, for heaven's sake. Mm -hmm. And that was never in the play, was it? That's something you just put in, old lady. Oh, I just put that yeah, in myself. Yeah, I, I don't remember that. I don't think Barry would have liked it. Yes, he would. <laughs> Mrs. Dally's very ill and nothing can improve back. I hope he isn't making a fool of me. also played in the Hallmark Hall of Fame production of Anastasia with Julie Harris. I've directed Julie in 15 productions, both on stage and TV, and to have those two perfectionists in the same show was one of the highlights of all the Hallmark years. It was on board the Shanda. I woke up and found a storm raging. There were big waves breaking against the hull, and I cried out, Grandma! And you came to my cabin. I'm crying out. Father, I'm crying out. Oh. I couldn't believe it first. Don't cry, don't cry. Come on, I don't say anything. You're warm, you're alive. That's enough. I don't stand anymore. Can't you hear my tired old heart beating? I must go home. Don't be afraid. 
<laughs> I will come back. of yours this afternoon. It's lovely, lovely. <laughs> do you like it? I certainly do. You haven't seen the back, have you? No, I have not. I no. would love to see it. Well, I'll show All it. All right, why don't you get up and do it? This, I gather this is one of your own creations, is it, uh, Miss Fontaine? Yes, I made it myself. Well, there you are. All right. Well, let My me... own fair hand. Oh, let me take a look at it. Uh, the other side. Yeah. Can you see it? Yes, I certainly can. Very striking indeed. You like it? I certainly do. I certainly do. You, you didn't wear this in a play, though. This is just a dress. No, I never wore it in a play. Well, I'm glad we're getting it on the on, on the record today, at least. No, yes. It's lovely, it's lovely fabric. It's all new and never seen before. It's another thing I'd love us to do if we could get back to, because it was such fun uh, before, huh. were those songs, those little. Uh, ditties from the music hall that you were entertaining oh, yes. me with with yes, all your I, apologies and we've one. got a name of one now that, that if i could find it here mm -hmm. that will will bring a cue it's called in a whitewashed oh. hospital Does in that a whitewashed hospital an old man dying lie his face was handsome frank and true the air was pent and gray have you no wife the nurse had asked no friends you wish to see. I had a wife, the old man said, but she was too young for me. An old man's darling was an old man's pride. An old man's darling, the sweet young bride. A youthful wooer won her, and we drift far apart an old man's darling broke an old man's heart oh lovely 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 <laughs> <You like that? sighs> uh, how i wish we had music hall in america today those mm. wonderful english music halls and there's one about a she was a dear little dicky bird chip 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 
she went. Sweetly she sang to me, though all my money, till, till all my money was spent. Then she went off song. We parted on farting terms. She was one of the early birds, and I was one of the worms. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's one. How did you ever hear those songs? Did you go to the musical? Well, I had a, I, I rented a room in Mayfair. It was a beautiful room, 18th century house, and a lovely window with fanned w windows, you know. I mean, panes that did that. Oh, I don't you mean no, mm -hmm. And, um, I, the, the, the East End used to come up to the West End singing songs all in a line across the street, late at night, no traffic, you see. And uh, they used to turn up my street and go up the uh, mews uh, and go right into Park Lane, you see. So they used to come up my street and I used to hear all the songs. I wonder if you could pretend for a minute that I'm just, I'm not me, but that I'm just some young actress or young actor who's kind of starting out, somebody in his teens in this country, and uh, looking for some helpful hints, any kind of advice or wisdom that you might have accumulated oh. through the years, and just, just uh, well, what would you say yes. if you had a young actor, actress well, in your Well, I would say one thing. If you're a success ever, and you are offered to go on the road, go. Because if you don't, you have no audience. Of course, I know it's, it's, it's now terribly difficult to go on the road, you know. They can't uh, get the theater or something or other. I don't know what it is. It's very expensive. But anyway, that is what uh, made Alfred and me so well known, is because we went on the road. Mm -hmm. And um, the letters I received, I received a letter from almost everybody in America when Alfred died, you know. Right. It's a way, that's a way to, of course, develop not only an audience, but your own, your own skills. In terms of training, in terms of things to be doing and not doing as a young actor or actress. Yes. Yeah. Well, I shouldn't, certainly shouldn't drink too much. I'd have a couple of drinks at night, but I wouldn't have more than that. You know, did I ever say to you that I think one of the secrets of our being happy right along while we were married was because we would go down to the theater and act two other lovers every night. That's interesting. Why? Well, we became two other people that night, you see. So we had a little variety. <laughs> This program was made possible by a grant from the Walter Schrader Foundation, Incorporated. Um.